Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to start today, assuming that my screen decides that it wants to collaborate here. There we go. Um, by talking a little bit about scaffolding and identifying where texts need scaffolding and selecting scaffolding strategies that will help students to effectively interpret content from those texts. Uh, in order to accomplish that, some of you had asked for a preview last time. So we'll be talking about the rationale for scaffolding. I'll give you a little introduction to scaffolding, and then we'll look at scaffolding across the three modes uh, over the course of the three webinars today. I'll just give you a little bit of a heads up that um, in order to provide the first two things, this first module is going to go just a little bit long, um, and then we'll make up the time in the other two modules. So um, just as kind of a little review to get you thinking again, when we think about high quality gold standard PBLL, we talked um, in previous modules about the importance of kind of making a progressive shift away from just doing quote unquote hands on projects, which require little use of the target language or culture, or cultural knowledge on the part of our learners. Um, and away from dessert projects where students practice grammar and vocabulary in order to produce the product project. Um, toward projects where the target language and culture are essential to project completion. As part of that, um, one of the things that we've been encouraging you to do is to help your students have experiences. Experiences with disciplinary content or academic, you know, content from other academic disciplines. We've encouraged you to help your students explore social problems or to connect your projects to opportunities to think critically about big concepts like freedom or big controversies. To spend time comparing and contrasting um, in terms of cultural uh, information and pragmatics. And in, in other words, to kind of help learners give or give learners opportunities to create with language in real world settings for authentic audiences and purposes. Now, one of the issues that a lot of you have raised is, well, my students don't know enough language to do that in the real world. And so the point of this current um, session is to get you thinking, maybe to help you shift your thinking about that a little bit um, and to help you to see some new possibilities for helping your students to do those things, even with limited language. So we're going to be playing with the idea of Legos today. Um, a lot of teachers make the assumption that creative language use is what in academia we might call a bottom-up process, meaning that you start with the individual components of language, you know, at the very most basic level, individual letters, and that students combine those letters to find to form words and that they combine those words in order to eventually form sentences and communicate communicative utterances. However, um, and the argument from a lot of teachers is, well, beginning learners need more pieces first. And what they mean by that is, well, they don't have enough grammar and vocabulary to construct language. But I'm going to suggest um, throughout these sessions that a lot of times we might be looking at the challenges our learners face from a slightly inaccurate perspective. And I'm going to suggest that maybe learners just need different pieces. And I want you to be thinking a little bit about the difference between this slide, specifically the image on this slide, and this slide, which one is more intriguing to play with. If we look at the Actful Proficiency Guidelines, they give us a little more uh, instruction about this. Specifically, that learners need opportunities to do a variety of things 
in a variety of contexts, which is what is so great about project-based language learning. Um, it gives learners the opportunity to engage with content and to talk about content in authentic contexts in ways that require them to think critically. And those three pieces are the absolute essential pieces for the development of proficiency. Uh, researcher Rand Spiro would suggest that rather than oversimplifying everything, that what we really ought to be doing is giving learners bite-sized chunks of complexity. So the idea being that we should be scaffolding their thinking and their engagement with content to free up the cognitive, or in other words, the, the mental resources that they need to process and produce language. So that by um, carefully structuring the content and carefully organizing their engagement with that content, they have more, um, more resources available. Another thing that some research suggests is that learners need more opportunity to play with language, to play with the pieces that we are giving them, and that they need support as they think through the various tasks. A lot of times we think about scaffolding, um, which I'll define soon here, in terms of um, you know, supporting learners in terms of giving them linguistic support, helping, giving them grammar or giving them vocabulary. But a lot of times the support that they really need is having someone help them to structure their thinking and to structure the decisions that they have to make in order to complete those linguistic or cultural tasks. So when we think about project-based language learning, there are three things, three areas where learners need support, which is what I mean by scaffolding. Um, First, they need to acquire information about the topic of the project, right? The things that they're going to have to do um, and the driving question that they're investigating. Second, they need opportunities to process and apply that information. So opportunities, if you think about a grown adult, we generally manage, um, you know, after we've learned something, we process or figure out what that learning means, usually in relation to someone else. We spend a lot of time talking to each other about the things that we've read or that we've watched or that we've listened to. And then the third piece is giving them opportunities to share their learning. So they need support as they produce linguistic output for authentic audiences about the things that they've learned. So these are the key phases of project-based language learning, and these are the key things that we need to scaffold. So what exactly do we mean by scaffolding? You can think of scaffolding as a bridge that helps learners to cross what Vygotsky, a, a Russian psychologist, called the zone of proximal development. And what we mean by that is that there is a distance between what learners can do by themselves and what they can do with help. And we are trying to bridge that gap and scaffolding is what allows the learner to sort of walk from where they can't do anything by themselves all the way toward where they can accomplish the task by themselves. And it's the adult guidance or in some cases guidance uh, and collaboration with other capable peers that help them to move from not being able to do it to being able to do it independently. In other words, scaffolding is the support that makes successful task completion possible for learners. And notice that what scaffolding influences is not just learners' knowledge, but also their confidence and their skill to be able to do tasks autonomously or alone independently. So here's an example of how you might think of the zone of proximal de development. Um, scaffolding are the stones that I might use to step on in order to get from one side of the river to the other. Now, often when we think about scaffolding, as instructors, we think about it like this. Well, I put some stones down there. I don't know why the learners are complaining or why they're falling off in the water or why they're not being successful. 
But take a look at the shape of these stones, the size of these stones, and what's on top of the stones, right? I haven't given my learners here equal, carefully designed steps. I've asked them to step on things that are kind of slippery. And there's more scaffolding in some places, or in other words, bigger uh, space to stand on in some places than others. These rocks aren't all flat either. And a lot of times instructionally, we do the same thing to our learners. We think we've provided scaffolding when what we've actually done is ensured that they'll fall into the water. Um, so as an example, whose definition of proximal are we using? If the word proximal means that it's close to the level of ability of the learner, what proximal is for this little guy would be very different than what proximal might be for an adult who's a seasoned rock climber. In other words, when we're thinking about providing support to learners, we need to be thinking or asking ourselves, have I included enough small, consistent steps to help learners bridge the gaps from one side to the other in such a way that they can comfortably cross from um, doing things with guidance to doing them independently. Now, as a quick caveat, scaffolding is not doing it for the learner or totally carrying the learner across. Rather, scaffolding supports learners in developing knowledge, skills, and confidence. Now, here's how teachers often think about scaffolding, to shift back to our Lego analogy for a minute. We want to give students all of the dimensions and the rules and the whys and wherefores of the language. To scaffold, we often try to explain the language to students. But here's how learners think about scaffolding. They want to do something with the language and they want just enough support to be able to accomplish what it is that we're asking them to do. And ideally, it's not even stuff that we're asking them to do. It's that they want support to be able to do what they want to do with the language. And we often don't think about that when we're designing projects. So we're going to take a few minutes to look at how Lego scaffolds things for, for students. Um, if you Look at this uh, page of instructions from Lego. Think a little bit about what you're noticing about how Lego helps learners to complete a project. And you can even drop those ideas into the chat if you'd like. Um, from a, an analytical standpoint, you'll notice that Lego provides lots of visual support. Because they do that, it is easy for any child of any age to access the information in LEGO's instructions, right? Um, whether they're two or three years old, or whether they have developmental delays, or whether they speak a variety of languages, these instructions are accessible to the, the majority of people. Secondly, they're colorful. Lego uses color to guide learners' attention to what they're supposed to do and in what order. The instructions are simple and sequential. Every step is broken down. They don't show students the final product and then say, here are the pieces you need to build it. They say, find this piece, find this piece, and then they clearly indicate this piece is going to go on top of that one. Now here's your next piece and here's where it goes. And notice in steps two and three, then they show them what the completed task looks like in step three before they move them to step four, just in case the learner didn't understand which of those little dots they're supposed to put that square on top of. This simple sequential step-by-step -step approach allows learners to perform very complex tasks generally pretty much by themselves. We can do the same thing when we structure experiences for students. 
by helping them to see the structure and to sequence the content. So we need to give them an opportunity to see what the end project or product is gonna look like, break that down into small parts, and then help them to see how those parts fit back into the whole. We need to move from what they already know to what they don't know. We need to start simple and move to more complex tasks. We need to start with the concrete and move toward the abstract, both in terms of language and content. And we need to focus on meaning so that they understand what's going on before we start having them try to influence form or to think about form. So giving them opportunities to play and to experience the language before we start dissecting and analyzing it and giving them um, all the rules, or in other words, contextualized interactions with the language first. So what kinds of support might learners need to be able to do that? Well, notice in this diagram that it's not just linguistic support. We can design the culture of the classroom, the purpose of the project, the context for the project, the processes we're using, how we structure the content and their access to the content, and how we structure their thinking. And linguistic production can break down in all of those areas. So it's not just the language that impedes their ability to communicate is, is my point here. One of the key things that I spend a lot of time telling my student teachers is that their job as teachers is to help reduce the cognitive load on their learners, or in other words, the mental effort that learners have to in, uh, invest in order to accomplish the tasks. And we can do that with a couple of key strategies. We can take away anything that is not directly relevant to the task. We can highlight key information. We can divide the chunks of content into, or divide the content into bite-sized chunks. We can provide structure and routines and procedures that are very consistent. We can support their thinking. And we can provide the input or the information using multiple modalities. In other words, they see it, they hear it, they move to it, they have a variety of different ways to access the information. So the product square is not so important here as looking at our own product squares and asking ourselves the questions on the right. So in order to scaffold, I have to first know what are students going to need to find out from these texts? Where are these texts likely, where is student comprehension regarding these texts likely to break down? And what supports might students need? If we think about texts and scaffolding texts just in terms of, well, here's the text, let me find all the hard words, and now I'll translate them, we're not going to be nearly as successful as thinking about why are these uh, passages in the text difficult for students. And so now we're going to shift toward thinking about what that might look like uh, as we scaffold interpretive inquiry. So as a bit of a preview for this section, we're going to be looking at how we might go about identifying the content or the need to knows for students, what we mean by culturally authentic, how we can locate authentic input for our projects, and how we scaffold those authentic tasks, or texts, excuse me. Um, so in the modules, I have posted a 20 page handout. And I'm gonna show you various pages from the handout so that you'll be aware of what's in there. And these pages are designed to help you to complete your deliverable for this set of modules which is that you're going to scaffold a culturally, you're going to locate and scaffold a culturally authentic text for your project. So in order to do that, your first step is to plan the interpretive input. So you're going to need to identify, okay, what's the general topic or issue that my project revolves around? What's my driving question? Then, as you remember, Yao talked with you last um, time about 
creating learning outcomes. So you're going to figure out what is the learning outcome that I'm targeting and what kind of in, in uh, linguistic input and content related input do learners need in order to achieve that outcome. So do they need information, for example, about a particular professional context or a particular academic content? Do they need background on the project? For example, different points of view about how people see uh, women and education, let's say, if I'm doing a project on education. Do I need to focus on giving them input about the cultural context for the project that maybe in a particular geographical region, um, young ladies don't have a lot of access to education? Or do I need to be thinking carefully about the pragmatics that they're going to need for the project? Specific cultural norms or speech acts or interactional norms or cross-cultural similarities and differences that are related to the content that they're going to be exploring. So what kind of input do they need? Or I, I hate to call it information because sometimes it's just an opportunity to hear other people talking about it but what kind of input do they need in order to pursue or to learn what they need to know so that they can accomplish the tasks that are associated with the project, both in terms of process and also in terms of producing their final product. So this worksheet's designed to help you think through that. So what do we mean by culturally authentic texts? There are lots of definitions, and for those of you with a lot of background in culture, you know that the, these definitions are hotly contested in some areas. But in general, what we're thinking about are materials, whether they are audio, visual, um, uh, multimedia, video, that have been produced by members of the target culture for members of the target culture. Why bother with culturally authentic texts? Why not just use translated ones? Well, if we believe, and we do, that intercultural competence is critical to developing advanced levels of proficiency, and you've seen a lot of examples of, of how that plays into the process from um, Marta's presentations, then we know that culturally authentic texts are going to contain cultural references and allusions. They're going to reflect cultural perspectives, and those things provide our learners with input or, or cultural exposure that helps them to become more culturally competent. So what kinds of culturally authentic texts can support the interpretive inquiry phase of project-based language learning? In other words, the phase where students are reading, listening to, and viewing texts in order to gather the information about their need to knows so that they can move forward with the project. Well, there are lots of possibilities. So once we've identified our necessary background information, and this worksheet is also in the packet for you, then your job is going to be to identify at least three texts. And you'll notice that I've given you a list in the purple box of a different uh, of a variety of different types of texts that you might select from. And I've given you some questions to help you think about um, your selection of texts. So for the purposes of your homework, we want you to identify a print text that is informational in nature about something related to your project. We'd like for you to find a literary or popular text um, so that might be something like a poem or a short story, or when we say popular text, it could be something like a little magazine article or essay. And then we want you to make sure you have at least one multimedia text. So a song, a video clip, um, something, you know, a piece of art, something that is not quite so traditional in nature. Now, making sure that learners have exposure to these different types of input is important because it's going to A, develop different types of skills for them as they engage with that input, B, 
it's, it tends to be more interesting and engaging for learners. And C, we're finding that when we ask teachers to prepare scaffolding for just one text, then the default tends to be they make, they give the learners the text and a list of comprehension questions. But if I ask you to scaffold learners engagement with three different texts, what tends to happen is that you start to think in terms of what do these texts have in common? What does text A teach learners that text B doesn't touch on? And how can I get learners to summarize and synthesize information from across the three texts? When we do that, it ups the level of cognitive engagement with the texts in ways that tend to make it easier for learners to acquire language because they, we and they start noticing and recognizing the words that get repeated in the texts as we're, as we're looking at texts that are about the same topic. Um, and it engages their critical thinking skills in ways that help them to hold on to those words. So let's look at some examples. Let's say, um, and, and I recognize that not everybody is going to be basing their project in something that's in their textbook, but because a lot of teachers have difficulty figuring out how to manage what's in their textbook, um, we're going to think about that for just a minute. So let's say that our textbook topic deals with health and hygiene. And that I've decided to connect that textbook topic to global issues like literacy and poverty. Um, surrounding the social problem of healthcare in the cultural context of the country of Honduras. Honduras. Um, and maybe I want to connect it to uh, career related things like health education or science, things that my students might be interested in. So as I'm looking for texts that will give learners opportunities to gather information about healthcare in Honduras, Maybe one of the things that I know that we're going to be working on is generating materials to help uh, the local population take better care with regard to um, the causes of dengue fever, right? So I'm gonna be looking for texts that are accessible for my learners. So let's say I have a beginning level class. On the left, you'll see that maybe my first text is going to be something really simple an infographic that shows this is um, what causes the fever and these are some of the symptoms. And we're going to assume that a lot of those symptoms might be things that might show up in my textbook vocabulary list anyway, right? So I'm trying to make the content pretty accessible in a pretty simple way. Then maybe the next text I use with learners is something that talks about um, how they might prevent um, this kind of fever. And you'll notice it's still pretty heavy in terms of images, but now we've got more complex text. Then I eventually may transition them into a text like number three, where there's still quite a lot of visual support, but this is a text produced for native speakers, um, which talks about what the disease is, how it is transmitted, what are the symptoms, right? Um, and so progressively, I'm building learners' understanding of the, the issue at hand and progressively giving them more complex opportunities to use their language. But each of those opportunities is coming in very bite-sized chunks. Then I might graduate them to a text where the information is provided without pictures, right? So thinking about as you're finding your text, not just how can I find the most simple texts, but how can I find texts that will progressively build learners' understanding of the topic? Here's another example that uses some multimedia texts. So maybe our textbook topic is weather or emergencies. Our global issue is natural disasters. We're gonna be focusing on emergency preparedness somehow in our, um, in our project, um, in the cultural context of Spanish speaking countries, or maybe just helping the local community to become more prepared in terms of natural disasters um, in our own particular area. So when I think about that, 
I might want students to be reading newspaper articles about natural disasters. They might look at videos of natural disasters. They might listen to community experts, uh, professionals talk in the target language about what to do in the event of specific natural disasters. Um, and these texts are all real texts. Um, I even found a video showing a school earthquake drill in a Spanish speaking country, for example. Um, or little technological texts where students from a Spanish speaking country are giving advice about preparing for natural disasters. So how do we find those kinds of culturally authentic texts? Well, we're going to put our search terms in the target language. If we want to get more specific results, we're going to put phrases in quotation marks because that tells the search engine to look for that specific phrase. We might search for specific types of media, use country specific search engines and um, look through collections of materials. And there is information about this in your packet. Uh, specifically, I've also gathered a collection of different types of texts and um, sort of portals where you can look for advertisements or collections of infographics in these various languages. Now, I will give you the caveat that um, because Wikispaces is closing, these links are only going to be good through July, and then I will have to relocate the materials. But this will give you a really good place to start if you're not super comfortable using technology to find your texts. Uh, when you go to the link, you'll see that you have options for lots of different languages. Um, if you happen to be a Spanish teacher, then I've organized the cultural materials in terms of a variety of different uh, types of texts and also in terms of a variety of different types of conceptual topics. For the other languages, I haven't had that much time and I don't have that much background um, in those other languages, and so yours will be a little more basic. Okay, so now that we know what scaffolding is, why we need it, and how we can um, locate culturally authentic texts, how do we help learners to acquire information from those culturally authentic texts? In your packet, you'll see a worksheet that looks like this, that's going to ask you to list the texts that you've selected, to think about what kind of content do you want students to pull out of these texts? Is it something cultural? Is it academic? What is it that you want them to understand from reading or engaging with these texts? Um, what specific cultural content do you want them to pull out? What language patterns do you want them to think about? And then it asks you to sort of think about, so what could you have learners do to think, what thinking tasks could learners do to help them uh, investigate these ideas? And what talking tasks could learners do? And then you're gonna see a checklist of lots of different scaffolding strategies. So now that you know sort of what that next step is in terms of your task, where can we, where are we going to be likely to see breakdowns when students engage with these kinds of texts? When I ask teachers what makes reading in the target language difficult, they usually tell me that it's because learners don't know the grammar and the vocabulary. And yet research on reading and literacy instruction tells us that there are a host of other reasons why reading is actually difficult for learners. Learners don't always have a clear purpose for what they're reading. They don't know why they're reading or listening to or viewing the text. It makes it difficult for them to select reading strategies that are appropriate for the purpose. They often don't have prior knowledge about the topic. And this is probably the single biggest thing that impacts our ability to successfully read and comprehend a text. So it's really important that we use pre-reading activities to activate that. Sometimes they don't have the language. A lot of times they don't have effective reading strategies or they're not cluing into the cultural assumptions and illusions made in the text, the references in the text. 
they don't know anything about the genre, which makes it difficult for them to predict or produce uh, information related to the text. They may not have the academic language or the little transitional words that they need, and so it makes it hard for them to understand the relationship of ideas in the text. And the text hasn't been scaffolded for them. So how do we go about scaffolding the input? Well, most reading researchers would tell you that you need to have pre, during, and post reading activities, that learners need opportunities to work through the text multiple times for different purposes each time. And yet most of the time when we give learners a text, we say, read this, answer these questions, done. But they actually need to read and reread and repeat the, their interactions with the text, but for different reasons so they don't get bored. And then a lot of teachers want to simplify the text. And although that is one strategy, generally what um, I would encourage you to do is to edit the task, change the task, or break the task into smaller chunks rather than changing the text. So here are a few examples. Number one, let's say that I'm looking at a video clip I want learners to watch. Maybe the first thing I'm going to do is only play the first 30 seconds of the video clip. And I'm going to tell them before they watch it that their job is to identify the topic of the, the video clip. What is this about? And what do you think is going to happen next? So they're only watching the first 30 seconds and then they have to make those decisions. This allows learners to get a sense of how fast the language is in the video, to sort of orient themselves to the video in a, in a, no stake, a low stakes way so that they don't get overwhelmed and shut down before they realize, oh, I could have understood that if I had just paid more attention at the beginning. Then maybe the second pass through the clip, I say to them, okay, now, obviously in the target language, um, we're going to watch the whole thing now that you kind of know what this is about. And now I want you to notice X, Y, Z as you watch, or I want you to form an opinion about whatever it is as you watch. Then the third pass through the text, I'm going to ask them to analyze the content of the video. So now I want you to notice how this person constructs an argument, or I want you to notice three things that are um, cultural, you know, three pragmatic issues that, that are illustrated in this video. Or I want you to craft a personal response to the video. We can also scaffold by giving learners multiple texts on the same topic from different perspectives and points of view. Here's a really simple example. This billboard is showing the word trust in French, but notice that it's illustrating it in three different contexts. It takes a lot of trust for someone to let you shave their neck with a straight razor. It takes a lot of trust to be led around by an animal when you can't see, and relationships require a lot of trust. So I could give learners opportunities to look at each of these uh, texts and then to think about, okay, what do you think this word means? And, and I might prepare them to do that by asking them to think about situations where they have experienced um, you know, trust in their own lives. I can provide them with multiple texts on the same topic. This is one of my favorite activities for introducing a new topic. So for those of you who teach in high schools, you know that the AP, one of the AP themes has to do with beauty. Um, and so I might ask students to find a partner, look at whatever slide I'm projecting, and then make a comment, question, or personal experience to their partner. Uh, based on what they see, and then find a new partner when the slide changes. What this allows me to do is to organize the slides so that I start with slides that maybe don't have a lot of language and that have a lot of visual support that illustrate different aspects of the concept of beauty. And then maybe I move progressively towards slides that have a lot more language. What this kind of activity does is it's asking learners to support each other's understanding 
as they're deciphering what the slides mean and thinking about the content. I can also post questions on the slides, specific things that I want them to say or do or answer with their partners in preparation for whatever it is that we're going to do. And I want learners to edit the task and not the tech, or I want to edit the task and not the text. So I can do that by giving learners smaller steps, providing more scaffolding for each of the steps, um, preparing a sequence of tasks that progressively build skills and increase in complexity, and matching the task to the level of my students. Here's a very lengthy checklist of scaffolding strategies that is in your packet, organized in alphabetical order. We're not going to take time to look at it right now because we're going to be looking at some of these examples during the rest of the sessions today. Um, but I want you to know that I've given you a very step-by-step -step process that sort of summarizes and gives you an opportunity to kind of check off, have I done this, have I done this, as you're scaffolding your text. Um, so these, these 10 steps will help you step by step to know how to do this for your own texts. Uh, there are also other things in the packet like uh, information about pre, during, and post reading activities in case you're not familiar with that. And I've also given you a list of different types of pre reading, during reading, and post reading activities. And you'll notice that many of the items on the list are hot linked. If you click on those links, they will take you to templates um, or activity instructions for those activities. So if you're not really sure where to start or how to go about um, engaging students with text besides giving them comprehension questions, this will give you lots of things to explore. Um, and then there are templates and strategy pages in the handout as well. Okay, um, I think that we should take a couple more minutes to look at how we scaffold um, the text itself, and then we will pause and shift to interpersonal communication. So I'm going to just pause here for a second and give you a chance to sort of Think, take a couple of notes if there's anything that you want to make sure that you don't forget before we move on because I know this is a lot of content. So I'm just going to be quiet here for about 30 seconds. One of the things that we don't do very well as teachers is give learners opportunities to process and to consolidate the content that they're being exposed to. And it 30 seconds feels like a long time, um, but learners need those silences to sort of think about what comes next and where they're at and if they have questions. So now we're going to get into the concrete task of, of what do we actually do with the text to scaffold it. And one thing that we can do if we want to apply, apply theories like Roy Lister's counterbalance theory, which suggests that learners need opportunities to notice patterns in the language, opportunities to become aware of those patterns when they're immersed in the language, and opportunities to have guided and communicative practice with those patterns. So we can do that by scaffolding the text through formatting. Novice learners don't know where to look for information and they don't know what information is important. And that's true both in terms of linguistic structures and also in terms of grammatical content, uh, sorry, uh, academic content, right? The, the stuff they're learning about. So we can use arrows, color coding, font sizes, and how we group information to help learners know what's important what to pay attention to, and to recognize patterns in the language. So we're going to look at a few examples. Here's a random text from a um, culturally authentic magazine. And the first thing that I would want to do as I scaffold this text is to remove anything that does not directly pertain to what I want learners to focus on. So I want you to notice the difference between this slide and this slide. 
Notice that just by removing the distractions, I make this text dramatically easier to read. Now that sounds very sort of duh, you know, um, but it, these kinds of things are things that a lot of times we don't think about that really do change learners' success with the tasks. The next thing I might want to do is think about how could I limit the amount of text so that learners are only having to pay attention to one chunk at a time. I might also want to think about how I could help learners notice patterns in the text. So this particular text, for example, um, learners have opportunities to see because of the way I've color coded it that there are characters that are repeated across the text and that a lot of the characters are the same. And once I see that, if I know just a few words, I can or a few characters, I can figure out what this whole text means. But I might have struggled character by character and gotten halfway down the page if I even persevered that long before I noticed those patterns. So something as simple as a couple of colored boxes and how I've laid out the text, or in, in this case, how this author has laid out the text so that everything is lined up makes those patterns easier to see. And you can do this in non-character based languages as well. I can scaffold by guiding their attention. So this is an example of a poster I made long before we used a lot of computers in my classroom. Um, and the goal of the poster was initially to show students how you put the ending G-O on the end of irregular first person verbs in Spanish. But what I discovered as I did it, because I color coded it, was that this also reveals the pattern for two form positive commands in Spanish you can highlight things in ways that draw your own learner's attention to patterns as well. And I can use technological tools to do this. So I can have learners um, look at only a particular part of a newspaper article I want them to read by using tools like Prezi that zoom in to a particular piece of the text. Another thing that I can scaffold is genre. Genre occurs within cultures for different social purposes, and they generally have specific structural and linguistic features. So for example, if I were to ask you for the key characteristics of a fairy tale, most of you could tell me they start with once upon a time, at least in the United States, they end with and they all lived happily ever after, there is a good character and a bad character. There's repetition. Things happen in threes, and there's usually a moral lesson. Knowing those things makes it easier for me to understand when I'm reading a fairy tale because I have some structure. It helps me to predict what's going to happen next in the text, and it helps me to keep track of where I am in the text. When I'm ready to actually go to post reading and produce my own fairy tale, these same genre conventions help me to do that in a culturally appropriate way. So helping learners to notice genre and to deconstruct genre conventions in your target culture is another key piece of scaffolding the text. So as an example of that, even if you don't speak Chinese, it probably won't take you very long to figure out what this is. In other words, a newspaper. How do you know? Can you find the date? I bet you can. Can you find a headline? I bet you can. Captions, are there any Chinese characters here that you know? Can you make predictions based on the pictures? All of that comes because of your knowledge of genre conventions and your prior experience with newspapers. We need to leverage those conventions for our students. Genre helps us to predict and produce. So this is an example um, from one of our former institute participants who had her students make multiple passes through a print text for different purposes. So Eling had her students quickly speed read the text to figure out what genre of text is this. Is this a newspaper article? Is it an ad? Um, is it a poem? What is this? 
Then she had them go back through and close read looking for main ideas. And to notice that those main ideas generally come at the top of the paragraph in a newspaper article. And then she had them read critically or carefully for um, the specific individual details. So genre awareness helps learners to predict, to comprehend, and to produce. Learners also make sense of text through the lens of their own knowledge and personal experiences. So think about how your prior knowledge of these different things helps you to guess what each of these um, characters is saying or these words are saying, even if you don't speak Arabic, right? You can probably guess what the signs mean. You can probably guess that some of them are street signs or, um, you know, whatever the case might be. In other words, if we want to scaffold interpretive inquiry, we need to think about first, how are we gonna activate learners' prior knowledge and experiences with the topic that they're going to encounter in that text? We need to build their background knowledge about things that they might not know. So if I am having my students read a text about Alaska and they live in Kansas, they probably don't have a lot of experience with the cultural or geographical features of Alaska. And that means there are a lot of things about the text they're not going to understand unless I give them experiences that help them to, to build that knowledge before we read the text. And that doesn't mean that I'm just giving them grammar and vocabulary. It means that I'm giving them uh, image, you know, input in terms of images, or we're talking about their experiences with snow, or whatever the case might be, so that they have more of a sense of what they're reading about, more of their own experience that they can draw on. I'm going to create schema, which means that I'm going to give learners organizational frameworks that I know are going to work for the content they need to remember, that will help them to structure that content when it's unfamiliar to them. Graphic organizers are great for that. Then I need to develop interactive tasks that engage students with the content of the text and the meaning of the text. So let's look at some examples of these things. I want learners to use their prior knowledge and experiences. So let's say that we're talking about families for whatever the you know, project is. Maybe I'm going to show them a picture of a famous family like the Simpsons that I know they're all going to recognize. So that as we talk about the different characteristics or the different roles that members in a family might play and we're comparing and contrasting culturally, they're all working from a, a shared paradigm. Maybe I'm gonna break the text into chunks. So instead of having learners read the entire text, maybe I'm only going to have them read headlines. Or I could even have them read something as complex as an academic text if all I'm having them do is read a few bolded sentences out of the abstract of the text. Um, so there are a variety of activities that if you come to the Summer Institute, we'll actually be doing some of these activities so you can see how they work. But the point is you don't have to use the whole text. You can just use a paragraph or a short excerpt that you do know that they will understand and then ask them to talk about that thing. You need to build conceptual understanding. So as an example, when I was a new teacher, I was teaching the text, The Little Prince, uh, in Spanish because that was what our school library had available. Uh, and my students, I came across the word baobab and I didn't know what it meant. And I went to the French teacher and I said, what is this? I can't find it in any dictionary. And she said, oh, well, you know, the, these are trees and they're real trees and they grow in Africa. And so I went and found pictures online of these trees. This is me standing in front of one that actually is on the uh, NFLRC's campus. Um, and I went through each of the piece of the sections in the chapter and I paired each piece of text with either an image from the book that showed what that was talking about or an image from real life so that my students over time 
uh, as they read through the text, really had the visual support and the conceptual support to understand this thing that they had no prior experience with. So the text talks about, even if he were to take a whole herd of elephants with him, the herd wouldn't be able to eat up one single baobab tree. Well, one of the things that I learned while preparing the text for my own learners to scaffold it for them was that elephants in Africa often graze on the bark of baobab trees because that bark um, holds hundreds of thousands of gallons of water inside of it. And so this is a real life picture of elephants doing just that. Then I can help my learners make personal connections to that by saying, so what are the things in your life that start out as little tiny seeds and become giant problems that are so big that you can't pull them out if you don't take care of them when they're you know, early. And I taught in an urban public high school for a long time. And so my learners were drawing pictures of the things that were baobabs in their lives, things like gangsters and drug sellers, for example. You can also create schema with things like infographics. So this particular infographic is pretty fantastic because it looks at what is friendship through questions like, how do you define friendship? What is friendship based on? Is it confidence or is it trust? How satisfied are most people who took this survey with their friendships? And what qualities do they look for in a good friend? So you'll see over on the right in the gray box that there are a list of the top five and the least five uh, sought after qualities in a good friend according to this particular infographic. So even though there's not tons of language here, there's enough language that it builds learners uh, understanding and there's also enough language here, enough visual support here that learners can understand what we're talking about and it gives us a lot of content to talk about as they develop their understanding of the topic in preparation for our project. You can create schema by asking learners to make predictions about the content of the texts. So I can use tools like Tagzito or Tagool that are free online tools where I can dump the text into those tools and it generates a word cloud that will um, adjust the size of the words based on how frequently they occur in the text. This helps me know which words learners really need to have exposure to before they read the text and it helps learners to predict the content of the text. So to summarize, we can create schema by interaction, experiences, and helping learners see relationships between ideas. We can also develop interactive tasks that help learners to play with the content of the texts. Um, we're gonna skip some of these. I can have them grabbing individual words. I can have them listen and pop up out of their seats when they um, come to a blank and they can conjugate those verbs if I'm focusing on form, for example. I can have learners matching the first half of the text to the second half, say as we're listening to a song. I can have learners sequencing texts or holding up pictures based on what they hear in the text to better solidify the meaning of the text. And I can engage learners with meaning in texts by having them um, focus on meaning, then on form, and then on using those forms to communicate. I can have learners annotating texts so that they're making assertions about the text or connecting to other texts or describing images or content or pulling out evidence from the text that supports a particular argument. I can have them generating explanations of cultural uh, issues generate, you know, that are in the text. So in other words, as we're organizing what we're having learners do with the texts, we need to be thinking about what opportunities are we giving them to make connections to them, their own personal experiences, to other texts, and to each other. I can have them making multiple passes through the text. So this is an example of an article that comes from a great online magazine called Muy Interesante. And they're just little short informational texts about lots of different topics. But what I love about the way they set up their texts is that they tend to bold the main idea in each of the paragraphs. 
and they highlight key uh, vocab words in red. And so I could have learners reading through this text. Um, for example, person A could read the first paragraph and I could only have them read the bold sentence. Person B could read the second paragraph, only the bolded sentences. And then I could have them turn to their partner and tell them the main idea of that bolded sentence. This allows the learner to focus on only one piece of information at a time. And it's a big enough piece of information that they can get a main idea, which then helps them to predict and to figure out what all the other pieces of the text mean. I can also be sensitive to academic language in the text. So these are words and phrases that describe complex ideas and higher order thinking processes and that transfer across disciplines. One great resource for that is Newzella, for those of you who are Spanish teachers. They provide sets of texts about different topics in Spanish. So discovering the world through science or politics in the US or problems in real, you know, in current society. And then the texts are two or three different texts about that topic. So it makes it easy for me to have learners get multiple exposures to the grammar and vocabulary used to talk about those topics. And I can adjust the grade level of these texts and it will change the text so that it is more or less readable um, based on whatever it is that I'm doing. So I'd encourage you to explore that if you are a uh, Spanish teacher. We need to wrap up here, so I'm gonna kind of flip through these other um, pieces quickly. And you can look at these later at your own leisure, um, and they are linked up on the website. But these are strategies on this handout for building academic language. And just to kind of summarize, so when we're scaffolding interpretive texts, we need to activate learners' prior knowledge and experiences, build their background knowledge about the topic through shared experiences, help create organizational frameworks for them to store that knowledge, give them interactive things to actually do while they're reading the text. So rather than just having them read, they're doing something with the content of the text as they read that helps them to better understand the meaning of the context. Um, and then engaging them with that meaning in different ways. There are handouts in your packet to help you do those things. Planning menus that will give you more activity ideas. And we are ready to pause and we're ready for the next module.